I am Shusara Konakumara. Welcome to Satsang. You are beginningless. You are endless. You are divine. Good evening, everyone. This is Shusara Konukumara, PLA and, and I both welcome you to Satsang with the Shambhala Center this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, last week was quite a, quite a show from uh, the responses that I got from people, and thank you for that. Uh, tonight, I think uh, we may be on another roll, so you'll want to sit tight for this one. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So give yourselves a nice deep breath. Close your eyes. Call yourself forward. Let's clear the space. Mother, Father, God that I am, through the great central sun hierarchy, through the office of the Christ, through the order of Melchizedek, I call upon Archangel Michael to bring the sapphire blue ray. Cut away, cut away, cut away anything in all of our four lower vehicles not emanating directly from our I Am Presence. I now call on Archangel Zekiel, Keeper of the Violet Flame. Blaze, blaze, blaze the Violet Flame through all of our four lower bodies. Transmute, transmute, transmute all the psychic debris Michael has cut free. I now bring forth the invincible ring pass knot and the mirror blue light of invisibility to completely surround each of us. And I call forth a shaft of pure Christ light for each one of us listening to the program. I ask that these tubes of light be brought to the center of the earth where I call on Archangel Gabriel to seal them. And I ask that the legions of Michael completely surround each tube of light. And now I ask that our vibrations be raised high above the psychic and astral worlds to the highest realm of illumined truth we each can attain at this time. And now, Mother, Father, God, we place ourselves in service to you and to humanity. PLAN and I place ourselves in service to all of you listening. We ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted into our perceptions and that all else of the lower mind be kept out. And we ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted through us. And because we have asked this, we consider it so. So be it. Lovely. Come back to me. I'm going to take a couple minutes here. I want to talk about uh, the protection. I think, did we do that in the beginning when we started to talk about the protection? Yes, we, we did. did. Okay. We're going to again, though, because we um, have picked people up along the way. And I actually had um, an individual comment um, recently on, uh, from the, the standpoint of kind of like, you know, if you believe yourself to be protected anyway, why would you need to protect yourself, right? And this is uh, a very common kind of um, ego-driven question because, of course, it's, it's setting up a, a space where one side is correct over another side, and that's all the illusion of ego. So let's look at what's actually going on here. Um, from a very fundamental level, my response to that question is <laughs> that... Uh, someone functioning from the state of illumination, first off, is going to recognize that within the um, realm of polarity, which you are certainly still attached to, 
because you're still here, yeah? Within that realm, polarity exists. It does because you're, you're walking it. And there is a level of quote-unquote reality to that. Now, within that dynamic, there are benevolent forces and there are less than benevolent forces, okay? Because everything has to be held in balance. So someone who is illumined would absolutely recognize that certainly the, the higher the vibratory level of, a, of an individual, the more resistance is going to come against them, right? Someone from that state also recognizes that the archangels um, and, and the legions of uh, angels who work with the archangels and the ascended masters, that they are here in service, but they can't be of service until they're asked to be of service, right? Because here in this realm, uh, free will has a very specific role, okay? And it is universal law that uh, no archangel or ascended master or anyone even uh, functioning from a level of illumination here in manifest form, um, it's universal law that you, you do not infringe on someone's free will, okay? So because you have free will, they could be right there waiting and willing to help you, but if you're not asking for it, they can't automatically give it, okay? Because that would be imposing their own will over the top of yours. See what I'm saying? Okay. So that's all functioning. Now, the greater question is, uh, does one who functions from illumination need protection? No, of course not. Of course not. However, here's the caveat, does the one functioning from illumination have resistance to having to ask for protection? Absolutely not, right? All things would be equal. So why not? Right. The greater question would be, well, why not? And I remember very specifically, it was years ago, but I remember very specifically, I was sitting on my bed one night and I was very religious about, about doing my protection. It was, you know, first thing in the morning and I would always do that right before I went to sleep at night. And then during the day when I felt like I was really being challenged energetically and <laughs> I was saying the protection and I got like maybe through... I don't know, maybe it was after I called on Archangel Zekiel. And I had that moment of, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, who, who am I praying to anyway? <laughs> like, you know, if it's just me, why am I even doing this? And it was hysterical. I just sat there and kind of laughed. And I was like, oh, my gosh, there's like really no need for it. Right. And I saw it so clearly. There's no need for this. But yet at the same time, what I saw was there's no resistance to it either. So if it's something that, that I can see could be beneficial in this reality where we're walking right now, then why on earth wouldn't I? There, it, you know, there's no resistance to it either way. So you know, it stopped for me being about saying words, and now it's more of an energetic. You know, I, I see it more than I say it at this point, um, personally, when, when I'm doing the protection. But then again, too... It's not always that either. If I'm working specifically with someone and I know that we're, you know, going into session together and it's it's going to be a, a real doozy, then I'll sit with them and say the protection out loud. I do it every night with my kids, you know, before bed. So it's kind of like, you know, it is the energy behind it, certainly, but you have to watch, and I'm going to talk more about resistance tonight, but you have to watch that when you when you come into something and you say you have the opinion of, you know, you shouldn't need this and you know, you should need that. There you go, because there's resistance built into that. And then you know that that's something you really need to look at. From um, the level of what's actually happening during that protection, I do want to speak to that, just just so you have an understanding of what's really going on there. Um, basically, the, the point of that is to clear your energetic space. And I remember you have four lower energetic bodies that start from the physical and work their way out. And, you know, they extend, I would figure, a good 20 feet um, outside of you in all directions. And the point is that when we call in Michael, first and foremost, Michael's there to cut away anything that's attached to any one of those four lower bodies. So a lot of times people will end up with attachments in the astral realm, right? That's the realm of emotion, emotional charge. And they will end up, I mean, some people literally can have things that are uh, energetic forms that are not uh, in uh, embodiment, and they will be stuck to them, 
and they literally are le- like leaching energy off of you, okay? Um, any kind of karmic tie that you have uh, because of your own identification. So, you know, you get in a big fight with your boyfriend and now you've got this karmic thing between the two of you. Those are the, the attachments that Michael can help cut away, okay? So to release you, um, even if it's temporary, <laughs> recognize that because just because it gets cut away once does not mean that the uh, that personal self is not going to recreate that karmic binding, okay? Um, but for that moment, Michael will come in and cut all of that away for you. Uh, Zekiel comes in with that violet flame and you literally see it as this beautiful violet purple fire and it it you know fires all about purification and it will come in and take all of that debris that Michael did cut from your four um, lower bodies and it will burn its way through them and as it does so you actually see it turn into this beautiful white um, sparkling light and it gets transmuted back into its divine form remember we talked um, in depth about the chakras and how the energy when it comes in is is pure um, and it gets disqualified when it hits our chakras. So it's transmuting all that back to that pure, pure light. Beautiful. Okay, and then we call in the invincible ring pass knot and the mirror blue light of invisibility, and those both work together. Uh, the ring pass knot is like a, it's like a buffer zone, right, that nothing can move through, and the mirror blue light of invisibility literally surrounds you um, so that anything that is looking at you uh, it gets kind of a mirror effect. It, it literally will not be able to see you through it. Okay, so as far as in other realms, something that may be looking to attach to you, you, you literally are surrounding yourself with, it's almost like the cloak of invisibility for Harry Potter, right? That kind of thing. All right, so uh, at that point, you're clear. The energy is clear. Now we'll call forth the shaft of pure Christ light. With that one, I always see it actually coming... Um, and this was just very natural for me. I never had anyone speak this to me because you kind of see it when you say it as if it's coming from above because everyone has this idea that like, you know, God's up there, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but the way I experience it is it comes from my core and it, and it just bursts out, right, into this tube of light. So it comes from the very uh, depth of the inside of you as if, even if that's possible. Um, and it just kind of expands out. So as it does, if there were anything there, it would push it with it. See what I'm saying? And then that tube of light, um, gets sealed at the, at the, the soul star, the center of the earth by Gabriel. And then the legions of Michael completely surround it. So at that point, there is, you are in this gorgeous tube of Christed energy that only your energy is in, just you, okay? Now from that point, when you're in that space, now we ask that the vibration be raised above the the psychic and astral realms. And at that point, it allows you to move to whatever level of um, illumined truth that you can attain. And you should feel a shift when that happens. Uh, If you're not feeling a shift, you need to spend a little more time and get a little more focused on what you're doing. These aren't just words to be repeated. It is the energy behind them, right? So if you're a very visual person, then use it visually. If you're, if words really help you, use use the words, use them both, like whatever whatever works. But the intent has to be there for it. And if the intent really is there and you're very focused, you will feel a lifting when you do this part. All right. And then, of course, it's always important to place yourselves in service. That is why you're here on the planet. And... Um, it's very easy to get bogged down in the, the me, me, me of being here and the me, me, me of even doing this work. But the uh, crucial factor is that you are in service. So you're there to place yourself in service to God above all else, um, of which you are a part, and then to humanity, because that is why you're here. And then at that point, we're asking um, that only that um, which comes from uh, the divine, uh, from the source, be allowed into your perception, right? So at that point, that the what functions from lower mind doesn't even come into your perception. Uh, and also that um, whatever comes through your mouth is divine as well, uh, that it comes in and out through you uh, as, as intended and not get distorted from the personal self. So that is the point of that protection. It's, um, it's very specific. It's very specific to my lineage, 
and I couldn't even begin to tell you where it came from. All I know is that it's powerful stuff, and uh, and I share it with everybody. So um, if you ever have any other questions, feel free to email us with them, and I'd be happy to answer them concerning the protection uh, questions for Shisada at the ShambalaCenter.org. Okay, so we're going to talk tonight about addiction. Oh, goody, won't that be fun? People go, what? I'm not addicted to anything, right? <laughs> You're a walking addiction. <laughs> so this will be interesting. I actually um, watched the movie uh, What the Bleep Do We Know again over the weekend. I have seen that movie, oh, I don't know, probably 20 times. I pretty much know it by heart at this point. And it was really beautiful because as with so many things, when you uh, walk your path, you will find that when you revisit something, you have... Uh, a greater level of understanding than you did the last time, right? Uh, certainly, if you watch The Matrix, you'll be doing that for a long time. Every time you watch that, something else will come. If you read, um, you know, Autobiography of a Yogi, you'll get that again. Something else is going to come. It's it's always like that. And uh, what the bleep do we know was really great because <laughs> this time for me, what was beautiful was where I saw the shortcomings in it. Right. So before I remember having the experiences years ago in watching that where it was it was like something that was so expansive to me that, you know, you'd sit there in that space of trying to reason it out, you know, and you'd feel like your head was spinning, like that kind of thing. Like I remember that when I first saw it, like I got it, but I couldn't quite get it, you know. And this time it was really beautiful because I was watching it with with another person who um had been in that place before and was now um, coming into a place where the understanding was pretty much there um, for what's really there for the majority of people to catch, which was great. And on my end, I was like, oh, wow, like there's that whole piece that's just completely missing from this movie, you know, and that's the piece that, that I carry and the, the piece that, that my guide, Tony Reyes, carries, that's why we're here to do this work because, you know, quantum physics is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not, it's not the whole puzzle. And you have to have the other piece. And when they're brought together, it's like it's this whole beautiful picture that unfolds. But the thing that I love most about that movie, if you have not seen it, please, please do watch it. It's fantastic. And what I love most is, is really how it does focus on the brain and the wiring of the neural net because it all starts um, with the identification of consciousness, but then you can take it, which they don't focus on, of course, because quantum physics gets, you know, even at that level, they're still very befuddled about the whole consciousness thing. Right. And, but you can take it. And uh, so it's like from the place of like epigenetics and, and work like that, they can see what's actually going on in the brain. And of course, I talked to you all about that because it's really important to see it that when the identification has occurred, there are things that actually, um, it creates this whole chain of events that happens in the body. And of course, the what's happening in the inner world is the same thing that's happening in the outer world. And that's why we, you can go to the physical level to help figure out what's going on internally because the internal stuff is so hidden and that sometimes it's almost easier to go to the physical level. So this level of work is really beautiful and it's, and it's so perfectly used in conjunction with the work that I do because it helps bring people's attention to just how addicted they are to their states of mind. Okay. Now remember that your states of mind are patterned meaning that from the very first moment of identification, there is a state of mind that is the first state of mind that gets presented, okay? And that's the state of surprise or of shock. It's always the first thing. It has to be the first thing because there's a pattern, and the pattern follows a pattern, and it never breaks out of the pattern, okay? So as soon as shock or surprise is witnessed, you know identification has occurred and the spiral, that downward spiral has begun. Now, I'm not going to tell you the order of things that's yours to figure out in your own work. But what I will say is this, in that moment when identification occurs, it causes this, the identification occurs because you believe in a story, all right? There's a story that has presented itself. That story is in uh, 
some sort of opposition to your belief system. Of course, your belief system has come into form because you have unmet needs. The unmet needs lead to desire. And that leads to creating a belief system that some things are desirable and some things are not desirable, that there are good things and there are bad things. Okay. And now, because we have that, now we can stand in the place of judgment. And the judgment is there to support our belief system. And once we stand in the place of judgment, now we also bring in justifiers because the justifiers allow us to be the judge and to feel okay about doing it. Okay. So it's all one little thing builds on the next. And it all came into form simultaneously. But this is kind of how it's functioning in, um, in the lower mind. As soon as you feel that sense of shock or surprise and the, um, the, the story is running, at that moment, there is um, a certain uh, process that happens in the actual brain. And I believe it's in the hypothalamus. But it, it's there to spit out a whole cocktail of chemicals which are directly related to the emotional state you're experiencing. So the chemical cocktail for jealousy is going to be different than the chemical cocktail for frustration. Okay? Some, some components will be the same, but other components are going to be different. All right? It's these, um, they're peptides and it's this whole chemical thing. So when that gets released, now you have, they, they get into the bloodstream and they literally go through the body. And remember, I tell you, what do I tell you when you get really triggered to sit down and do nothing and feel the energy, right? And uh, PLN, what has been your experience of feeling the energy in that moment? Uh, well, in the beginning, it'll try to be crazy. Um, but um, I've done it where I actually just sat down and let it run. And you're not really attaching to what's going on. You're just feeling the energy of it. And, um, I mean, you look like you're psycho at that point in time, <laughs> but, um, it actually will, will subside. It'll just kind of go away. And then you're able to see what really just happened in that situation. Exactly. So in the beginning, it's very difficult. Like you said, it's, it's very difficult. Why? Because, <laughs> Because they are chemicals you are addicted to. And what happens is as the chemicals are moving through the bloodstream, you have these um, things called uh, receptors on each cell. And cells will have multiple receptor sites on them. Well, the receptor sites are there to specifically fit to a particular chemical. Okay? So let's put it this way. If you have someone who is angry all the time, They have more receptor sites for the chemicals that are related to anger on each cell than they would for the chemical related to love, let's say, okay, Um, or or, uh, excitement, okay. So it becomes this thing where even if the chemical for uh, excitement or joy gets released, there aren't as many receptor sites in on the cells, on the surface of the cells to even allow those to dock in and allow you to feel it. But there are a ton for anger. So when that gets released, you feel it big time, right? You feel it everywhere. Okay. When the energy runs and you don't attach to it, meaning that you've identified with the story. I want to make sure you understand this. I'll try and slow it down a little bit. You have already identified with a story. Your belief in something has been challenged. Okay, and through that challenge, now you've had to choose a side and now you're identifying with the side you're choosing. In that moment, these chemicals are released and now they're running through the body and they're looking for um, docks to, to sink into so that the chemicals can get into the actual cells of the body. Okay, at that point, if you take action which for those of you who, who have done this work with me, you know that this is called the swing. The swing happens when you take action, okay? Action can be like yelling. Action could be storming out of the house. Um, action could be just literally a thought in your head where you go, lots you know, right? That could be it, okay? There's even action by non-action when you purposely don't say anything, 
because that's your pattern. Your pattern is that you will withhold yourself and you'll shut up like a clam, right? That's still a form of action, even though it doesn't look like you're doing anything. When those things happen, what's actually happening is in that moment, these um, cells are docking in, or excuse me, the, the chemicals are docking into the cells, the receptor sites in the cells, and it creates an endorphin rush. That's what makes you feel better in the moment, okay? So let's look at something simple as the state of indifference. In the state of indifference, something just triggers you, and you have someone who's, who will say something to you like, you know, I don't know why you always do that. And in the moment, you go, you know, believe what you want. I really don't care. Okay. That's indifference. Indifference covers up deep pain. It's put there so the person won't feel it. Okay. What's actually happening is the person feels very victimized, and they're dealing with guilt and shame but they don't want to look at that part. So what they do is they put on this false front of indifference that says, it doesn't matter to me, whatever. Whatever is like the perfect word for indifference, whatever. And the person who says it will be like, you know, I really don't care anyway. As soon as you hear that, you know, oh, I gotcha, because of course you care or you wouldn't say that. There wouldn't be any reason to say I really don't care anyway. Now, as soon as, you, as soon as that indifference comes forward, that is the swing. Because in that moment when you go, yeah, believe what you want, I don't care. In that moment, if you allow yourself to really look at that statement, you can feel it. You could feel the shift in energy, right? You're nodding at me, so you, you're seeing it. I'm hoping all of you are seeing it. And something as simple as that, I don't care anyway. There is a shift that happens. We're literally... The, at the same time, simultaneously, these chemicals are docking into the cells and the endorphins get released. And in that moment, these endorphins get released, you actually will feel a physical shift in the body. All right. That's why if you're a really angry person and someone ticks you off and you punch a wall, it may hurt like hell after, right? You may end up with a broken hand, but in the moment when you punch it, you'll feel better. If you're a screamer, right? And when your kid says something to you and you just turn around and just holler at them, in a moment, even though mentally you can say that, that this isn't good, in that moment, if you look at the energy of it, the energy says, oh, yeah, that feels really good, right? And that's why. So when you're sitting and you don't do anything, okay, you're not allowing the identification with the story to take over the reactive mind there, you're actually stopping the process. And in that moment when you stop the process, those receptor sites don't pop out of the cells to pick up the chemicals. And where are the chemicals going to go? They can't dock in, right? So they just kind of flush out. And, and literally you will feel it as this, you know, it doesn't happen in a second. It takes a few minutes, but you'll feel this abatement of the energy. It just kind of backs off. And then it's like all of a sudden you can be kind of coherent again. Because before you were functioning out of a very reactive place, the reactive part of the mind. You know, it took over. And your own will does not play a part in reactive mind. But if you can, if your observer is strong enough to at least stop you just, just short of doing whatever it is you would normally do, and you could stop yourself and just sit down, right? Now your own will slowly we'll be able to come back in and you, you kind of take back over. All right. Now, when it comes to addiction, here's the thing. You're addicted to the states of mind that you exist in the majority of the time. So it's no different than a heroin addict addicted to heroin. It's no different than a cigarette smoker addicted to nicotine, an alcoholic addicted to alcohol. A shopaholic addicted to spending money, right? A bulimic addic addicted to eating large quantities of food. It's all the same thing. Now, the thing that people can't see with, with a level of addiction is they can see it in the outside world and say, well, obviously you can get addicted to smoking or drugs or alcohol, sex. You can be addicted to that. But they can't see, remember, that the inner world and the outer world are the same thing. Okay? One's just a reflection of the other. What's happening is that in the lower mind, the lower mind as a program, okay, th what ends up happening is because the program runs all the time, the body, which is, is the reflection of the state of consciousness of the one who's utilizing 
the elemental body. Now that body physically becomes addicted to the chemicals that are related to those states of mind. That's why when you do this work, uh, and you were, you were just talking before the program, you know, in the beginning of the work, it becomes very exciting because you start to see things very quickly and it's like, oh, that's fantastic. But then you reach this point where it gets really challenging because now it's not a, um, in the beginning, it's almost like you, because you're excited and you're feeling good, you're seeing some results, it's like your, your will is, uh, your sense of willpower is strong enough to carry you through the moments where you are getting challenged. But after a certain point, that stops, right? And the challenges don't stop because you're addicted to them. So of course they're going to keep coming back. What happens to a heroin addict if they stop taking heroin? It's not very long at all, a matter of hours, and they start feeling it. And then they're like, oh my gosh, like I have to get my next fix. And then what happens if they don't get a fix? Then they have to go through withdrawal, and withdrawal is an, an ugly, ugly process, isn't it? Well, you're going through withdrawal when you do this work. It's not any different. So don't think for a second if you're doing this work and everything seems to be going peachy. And let's say you're someone who, like, your big thing is you yell at your kids all the time. And that's been like it was you were yelled at as a kid. And so, in, like, you lived in a neighborhood where, like, let's say you were raised in like a, a Sicilian family or something, like everybody just yells at everybody all the time, right? So you think of it as a very normal thing. And in that culture, it's accepted as normal. Well, the energy behind it certainly isn't a very positive, uplifting thing, but it's accepted, right? But if that's your norm, of course, you've taught that to your children and now you, you do it all the time and you never think anything of it. So you start this work and you have a moment where you recognize like, oh, Oh my gosh, like I, could, I just saw it. Like I yelled at my kid and I literally saw them. I saw the shock on their face and I watched them start to spiral. Oh my God, like I'm doing it to other people. And so you have that moment of awareness where you're like, oh, like I, that needs to stop, right? That needs to stop. So in the beginning, because you're so committed, you've seen it and, and what you saw hurt you because they are people you love dearly. And so in the beginning, because you're committed and you, you, know, you want to quote unquote make change, it will be easy to hold your tongue. And then you'll watch after time, it gets a little more difficult and a little more difficult. And then now you're biting your tongue, <laughs> right? And now you're, you know, you just start to go, ah, 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 and then you might stop yourself and walk in another room. But before long, guess what's going to happen? That monster is going to get unleashed. And this is a dangerous little place because you are the heroin addict who, who just went through four days of withdrawal without wanting to, and now you just got a stash in front of you again. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to hit it, and you're going to hit it hard, right? And so this is what happens uh, to the person who does the work, that in a moment when that observer is not really strong, and the reactive mind kicks in. Now at this point, you most likely are just going to fall right back into the pattern, and you may find there's a lot more energy behind it because it's been withheld for so long. And that certainly can be quite detrimental to those around you. Here's a little piece that people don't understand. Within the, the this is fascinating to me, within the structure of the cells, these chemicals, you know, that, that run through the bloodstream and then they end up getting docked into the cells, the cell will actually hold a piece of that chemical in reserve. Okay, and it does this for a very specific reason. It holds it in reserve so that it, if it gets to a point where it hasn't had its fix, it can actually pull that up. And what happens in that moment is when that reserve of the chemical gets brought forward in the cell, that's when you will witness images coming that trigger you. It'll be an image, you know, so nothing has to happen in the outside world. All of a sudden you'll have an image that pops in of, let's say, uh, coming home from work early and seeing your husband in bed with another woman, right? So let's say everything seems fine, hunky-dory, and all of a sudden that image pops into the head, and all of a sudden you're right back there. It's present. Well, that's exactly what just happened. The cell just released it. And now what's going to happen? Well, now you're going to go run with that image attached to that story, feel the pain, and all of that chemical gets released again and floods the body, and now your cell gets its fix.
Okay. And it literally, this is the process that leads to the deterioration of the physical form. It's this process right here. So the, the uh, scientists will tell you that the physical body is literally created to be able to um, exist in a very youthful state for a very, very long time. I mean, they say at least 250 years. There's like no reason that the body should degenerate the way it does, right? However, what happens is that these chemicals, they flood the cells so frequently that the cell now is so bogged down with dealing with this whole chemical cocktail um, and it can't utilize its resources to go to healing the body, you know, to go to nourishing the body. So <laughs> if you think of it that way, you know, like if you're a really angry person but you eat like an amazing organic diet, does the diet really matter? If what's going on inside the body is that the cells are being bombarded with really, really dense um, negative energy because the cells can't function the way they're meant to function, you know, or if you're, and we'll flip it, you know, how many people have heard about the, the old man who lived to be 102 and ate bacon and smoked cigarettes, you know, his whole life, right? And it's like, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Well, sure it does. He was a very happy, content, peaceful person. So his body wasn't fighting anything. It was able to take the nourishment that he did give it and utilize it to its fullest, Right. So it took care of the body the way it's meant to. It's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Okay. So the point is that it's time for everybody to really become aware of what you're addicted to. Okay. I had my, um, some of my longtime students do an exercise for me um, that I really meant to bring forward in the last show and we just kind of ran out of time. It was, it was on my note sheet that I didn't get to refer to, <laughs> right? And what I had everybody do was uh, to, and, I, and I'll tell all of you listening, do this because this is a really great exercise. Um, make a list of all of your own personal attributes, the things that you can look at, you know, kind of who you are and what's positive about you, okay? And you have to be willing to go in and to be really honest, which is very difficult for people. And I always I love to use uh, women might not be willing to say I'm attractive if, say, when they were growing up, they had girlfriends in junior high school. If the girl said, oh, my hair looks really good today, they'd be like, oh, you're so conceited, right? And in that moment, there's the shock. And now here's the spiral. And now you feel pain associated with thinking of yourself as attractive. So you stop doing it and you stop allowing yourself to do it. And what was the, what was the quote you said to me earlier? God don't like ugly. Was that, <laughs> was that it? Yeah. Yeah. So that'll do the same thing. Okay. So you have to be willing to, to really pull back and go to your heart and say, you know, really, what are my attributes? Right. So we're looking for you know, positive judgments, I'm loyal, I'm hardworking, I'm kind, I'm compassionate, you know, whatever. And then here's the next piece. So for my students, I haven't given you the next piece and I'm going to right now. The next piece is to take that list that you've made and look into your outer world to those you spend most of your time with. And I want you to see if, if those qualities are being reflected back to you. Or aren't they? All right. So example, you're a really, really super, super hardworking person and you live with someone who's incredibly lazy. That obviously isn't being reflected back to you. And there's something to be seen in that, isn't there? So you can you can look and say, well, I, I am hardworking, but yet what you're seeing in the world so much is this lack of that okay now this is important because this is remember I've been talking to all of you about where you're making your choices from okay this is important part of what's happening there is that you're addicted to playing the victim so if you're a hard-working person 
and you are priding yourself on the fact that you're hardworking, you can't see yourself as lazy. So, of course, it has to manifest in the outside world, and you're going to see it there, right? Okay. Now, through enough of this work, you can actually move into that beautiful buddhic state of non-attachment, where you can be hardworking, and you can have the lazy person right there, and it won't affect you at all. And that's lovely. But the work goes deeper than that. Okay? There's more to it than that. You're here on the planet living in this state of polarization to continually be given the opportunity to increase your level of mastery. All right? Living in a state of detachment is, is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, most people would consider that like nirvana, right? Peace and chaos is a beautiful thing. Of course it is. But there's something beyond it, and the beyond it is called right action. So let's, let's go back to the example of the hardworking, um, let's say it's a hardworking woman who's with a man who's, like, really lazy. And so she's, like, let's say they have kids. So she's, like, she has a job, and then she's also taking care of the kids. And, you know, he goes to his work, and then he comes home, and he doesn't do anything. And then she's cooking and doing all the dishes, and she does all the laundry, and she does blah, blah, blah. You know, she takes out the garbage like she's doing almost everything. And he just kind of sits there and vegges out on the couch at night. And she's so frustrated because she's, like, exhausted every night. And then he wants to get in bed with her and have all this fun time. And she's exhausted, <laughs> right? Like, I've got nothing left. And now she starts to resent him. Okay. Now, when you get beyond the state of non-attachment, there comes a point where you have to look at where you're functioning from here in this world, okay? If you are with someone who refuses to honor the relationship in any way that it can be honored, you have to be willing to look at that. And you can't use, and here's, here's the key, you can't use your spiritual understandings as your scapegoat for not doing the right thing. You can be addicted to playing a martyr, right? I do everything around here. You're addicted to that. You know, oh, I always find a guy who, you know, loses interest in me really quickly. You're addicted to that. So when you're out looking for a guy again, who do you think you're going to find? Remember, there's only one mind. You think it can't recognize itself? <laughs> so when you go out looking for someone, they may put on a really pretty face. You don't think the mind sees exactly what's happening with itself? It knows who it's picking. Don't think for a second that it doesn't. It knows who it's picking. It's picking the exact person who's going to trigger all your patterning because that continues the program. It's to its own benefit. All right? If anything, you know... <laughs> Run the other direction when it feels natural. <laughs> That's what I tell people all the time. Until you get to a certain point, just run the other direction. Because if it feels natural, it's most, chance, most likely it's just not going to be right. Because it's just going to feed the program. So we go back to the, to the couple. In that they're, they're a married couple. What is, what is the value of, of marriage Right? What is it that each person is supposed to, you know, from the space of their heart, bring to the relationship? Is it supposed to be, you know, like a 90 10 equation? Or is the point of pairing up with someone and sharing your life with someone that, you know, you're, you're like two halves making a whole, right? Or two wholes making a more complete whole. Think of it that way. So if you're in a situation where there's something very unbalanced, Living in a state of detachment is not going to help the situation. It's enabling the situation. This is really important to understand. You are here to increase your level of mastery. Where do you make your choices from? If you can walk through this reality constantly seeing not people, but the ego everywhere, and you move into the state of awareness where it's literally God having discourse with ego all the time. 
and you stop seeing him as your husband and start seeing it as a program, at that point, where what would your heart do? Detach from it and pretend it doesn't exist? No. Your heart from a space of compassion will do what it can to show the other where it's going wrong. And maybe it gets done by mirroring it back to the person. Maybe you just get super lazy all of a sudden. Show them what it's like to, to walk that, right? Because they'll see it. Because they're not going to get what they're used to getting from you. They can slack and you'll pick it up because you always do. And you're resentful about it, but you do it anyway. And they just got what they wanted, so it worked for them. And they can handle you being angry for a couple days, but they got what they wanted and everything's fine. Where's the honor in that? Are they honoring you by doing that? Are they respecting you by doing that? And are you honoring them? This is probably the greater question, because that the first is so obvious. But are you honoring them by allowing them to function from such a disqualified place without bringing it to their awareness? Now, certainly they have their free will. If they choose to be lazy and that's who they want to be, you know, the more power to them, that's fantastic. But you don't have to be there to walk that with them. And then the greater question is, if you are there and you're walking it with them and they say, but I like myself the way I am, why on earth are you staying? And this is the thing that's so key right now. When I say to you, where do you make your choices from? It's because whatever, you're, whatever level you are making your choices from is going to dictate how you move through this reality going forward. Okay? Because... For everybody functioning from patterned consciousness, you are living your past right now. So what do you think happens with the choice you make right now? It becomes the past you live tomorrow. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Yeah. There's nothing present in any of it. You're just continuing the program and continuing the program. Within that, where on earth are you open to receiving all of these beautiful attributes that you wrote out about yourself? If you're constantly in victim mode, how can you receive someone who's going to be kind and compassionate and loving to you? You can't. And you literally, believe it or not, you'll push it away. When it does present itself, you could be presented with the most unbelievable opportunity for a mate who could, you know, make all your dreams come true. And literally, you would come up with ways subconsciously of pushing that person away or come up with all kinds of things that you would believe about about the person that mind just conjures up just just to to create that wall that sits there that says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to allow myself to go there because deep down I don't think I really deserve it. And what a shame. I mean, you know, you, we have this incredible opportunity here to experience the divine right here in manifest form. Even within polarization, you can experience incredible levels of joy in peace, ecstasy, absolutely, you know, and, and you can move into the state of awareness where you can't not see the magic of this place, you know, even in its ugliest, it's magical, it truly is. That's part of the beauty of this non-reality that we all believe ourselves to be experiencing right now. It is pure magic. But where on earth will you ever have the chance to experience the magic, to experience a life beautifully lived, where you're empowered and those chakras are qualified and that energy comes in from your source, right? From your higher source. It is you. It's you sending you energy. 
Okay, think of it that way. And you're sending your own unique energy in. And you have an opportunity to be here in physical form and have that energy stay qualified and you can move it in the world. And you can live an extraordinary life. Or you can continue functioning from what feels normal and natural and use your um, instincts because you think that those are accurate, never mind the fact that instincts are based in disqualified energy as well. Your intuition and your knowing are qualified. They are the divine. But your instincts, uh-uh. Gut feelings, uh-uh. Nope. It's part of your programming. So when you, you know, meet a new guy, and you're like, oh, I don't know, something quite doesn't feel right. Fantastic. Follow it. <laughs> see what happens right okay I'm hoping that I gave you all something really worthwhile to look at now well, no I did I'm hoping you all understand how worthwhile it is to look at it <laughs> it's important it's really important and um Going into our final meditation, I just wanted to say very quickly, the point of these meditations is that a lot does come up during these sessions, and I'm sure that as I speak, there are things that hit you, you know, and you have a chance to really look at. And the point of that last meditation, um, it's not just for you to kind of sit there and not do anything. It's there to give you a, an opportunity to look a little deeper or to transmute the energy that does come up that needs to be cleared, because you literally are shedding layers of consciousness as I'm speaking and uh, if, you know, part of my work is to help you transmute that. And that's what I'm doing during the meditation. Uh, PLAN and I both are working for you to help facilitate that. So just know that. Um, I guess that's it for tonight. I'm looking forward to next week. And we shall see you then. So much love to all of you. Have a beautiful night. Thank you.